I think a key take home lesson is these issues are tricky and hard and you have to come at them from different angles and there's not just one path to victory. Right, that makes sense. I just wanted to say that one of the things that I think work a lot uh, with us, uh, work well, is that we try to keep this group as diverse in membership as possible. Uh -huh. So as Sarah just mentioned, we were able, we got louder. We started loud because we started with a huge flag hung in the atrium, but we kept being loud and that was because we were diverse in membership. Free to Grow in Forestry, a podcast working to move forestry forward. The Canadian Institute of Forestry and the Center for Social Intelligence proudly present the Free to Grow in Forestry podcast. The Free to Grow in Forestry initiative was launched to create a diverse and inclusive workplace culture where all Canadians feel they belong. We believe strongly that inclusive cultures not only strengthen our Canadian forest sector economy, but also create resilient and healthy communities. This podcast seeks out guests from all aspects of the forest sector, from the C-suite to every part of the underrepresented communities to open up the dialogue on issues of concern and points of view so that everyone has greater knowledge and understanding of each other. By unearthing these discussions, we hope to stimulate greater empathy and respect for all people, opening up the forest sector to be more welcoming and accepting of everyone. For our eighth episode, we are pleased to be joined by our host, Kelly Cooper, founder and CEO of the Center for Social Intelligence, and our guest, Dr. Sarah Gergal, professor and former associate dean of diversity and inclusion for the Faculty of Forestry at the University of British Columbia, and Stefania Mija Moreno, who is a PhD candidate, also in the Faculty of Forestry at the University of British Columbia. As co-founders of the UBC Forestry Diversity Crew, Sarah and Stefania discuss their journey and motivation towards creating a more diverse and inclusive space, both on campus and in life. This session was recorded live on December 9th, 2021. Hello everyone, my name is Kelly Cooper and I am the diversity and inclusion expert guiding the Free to Grow in Forestry initiative and your host for the podcast. Today I have the pleasure of speaking with the co-founders of the University of British Columbia Faculty of Forestry Diversity Crew, Dr. Sarah Gergel and Stefania Mija Moreno. Dr. Gergel is the first Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and she worked with Stefania and others on the diversity crew to create meaningful change in the EDI arena through a multitude of creative and innovative approaches, which I'm looking forward to talking with them about today. Stefania is a Latina Mapuche mom and scholar pursuing a PhD in the Faculty of Forestry at UBC. Welcome to you both to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's wonderful to be here. So how about we start with taking us back to 2016 when the diversity crew started? What was the motivation behind it? And how did the Faculty of Forestry at UBC make space for an Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, or EDI? So the start of the diversity crew came about due to the intersection of a couple different things on campus. So one unfortunate thing that happened was a pride flag on UBC campus was burned. And so the burning of the pride flag was obviously something that was upsetting and distressing to many of us. And I had just started my position as the assistant dean of diversity and inclusion in forestry. It's very new, very green at the job, but I was grateful that several of our grad students came to me to talk about what we could do in terms of showing solidarity and showing support for our LGBTQ community here in forestry and at UBC. And so we had a conversation about what to do. And the first thing that we came up with was, in fact, getting funding and asking if we could hang a pride flag in the Faculty of Forestry atrium. So we did that. It was the first time that a pride flag had ever been flown in the building. And so in subsequent years, we also turned that into additional Pride Week celebrations. And so every year following that during Pride Week, we would also, again, hang our Pride flag, but then also make sure that we had a variety of activities as well as uh, celebrations, as well as educational events for everyone in our building, in our community. 
And so that was how the diversity crew came into being. And I felt really grateful that the students felt like they could come talk to me and that we could work together moving forward. I remember that time that when we wanted to react and just we gather in the atrium and we kind of face a lot of bureaucracy. Uh, we wanted to have a clear and supportive response, uh, but we had to wait for approval or you know all of that. And that was the time that we realized that we needed to form a group that had some independence. Um, and, and, and as Sarah mentioned, um, just the, the first pride flag that we hung uh, was actually made out of uh, tablecloths, plastic tablecloths. It was a very do-it-yourself kind of fla a flag that we made. And I think that that was the spirit of, of everything we did. It was completely creative, very low cost, and, and not follow very much the bureaucracy. And, but when Sarah joined us uh, in this quest, we had that backup that we needed from somebody with an admin position with power. Right, yeah. And so, so maybe we can go back one step further and just find out how that position was created because I think that's rather unique. So Sarah, can you speak to that? In terms of how my position came into being, I was the first uh, assistant dean of diversity and inclusion for UBC's Faculty of Forestry. And it was it was really the idea, it was a pretty forward-looking idea by our dean at the time, John Innes. And he had asked me to serve in this role and given me a fair bit of latitude to really define the position and decide where we should go and what we should do. And I must say that five or six years ago when this happened, the conversations around EDI were were very different. It was a different world, a different conversation than the kinds of things that are more routine now. So I was I was really given a lot of latitude to decide what to prioritize and to decide what types of activities we would pursue. That's great. Like that is yeah. unbelievable. I, does any other university in uh, in Canada have that kind of a position? Well, so now there it's more of a typical position, okay. right? There's a lot Back of associate then. deans for, uh, for diversity and inclusion now, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we were the first one in a forestry faculty, but I say that when the position was created, the conversation was very different than, than it is now. Yeah, I'm sure. And you received an award from the Canadian Institute of Forestry for your accomplishments at Diversity Crew. Can you tell us a little bit about what led to that award? Where to begin? <laughs> <laughs> Stephania might want to talk about some of her favorite events, and I can talk about some of my favorite uh, events as well. Do, do you want to start, Stephania? Yes. Um, well, I remember that this was the first, this is an inaugural prize um, that, that from the Canadian Institute of Forestry in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion. So there wasn't like a clear... I mean, what I want to say is that it was pretty new for everybody, not just to us. So we have done a lot of things, but we we haven't been awarded formally until now. So it was it was a big thing for the diversity group. I think that one of the one of the events that I um, keep in my heart uh, until today uh, was when we invited uh, Jackie Yenga. A friend of mine, she is from Cameroon. She's a dancer, storyteller, a very fierce woman and role model for so many, especially for people that love dancing. Um, and, and we had Jackie and Grandpa, who is from Benin, uh, with drums in the atrium. So a place that was always a place of silence and sometimes a place where many of us felt that we didn't belong, all of the sudden became a place of reunion, of joy. I remember there were kids um, and drums all over these three, four stories buildings. That was one of the events that I really keep in my heart. The other one was uh, one, I will say three. There are so many, but I will just stick with three. The other one is uh, when we wanted to um, have pictures of how we say forestry in different languages, because when we started to gather with the crew, we realized that there is so much diversity and, and it can be expressed in something as simple as 
the word forestry and knowing that forestry sometimes doesn't translate in other languages. It's a much bigger uh, uh, concept. And so we did that video and it was very, very nice because people came and said, oh, I haven't talked with my grandma. And so I had to call here and we talk about the forest. So it was very, very, and the video still remains. And when I see the video, I know many people are excited to see it but all those memories are also captured in that video like knowing that people connected with their relatives and all of that and the other and it was a pretty pretty amazing example of how diverse our, our bc faculty of forestry is and just see it all on screen all at once i think uh pretty moving for a lot of us because so many different languages were represented and it just it was more a, a kind of bonding experience than we even could have envisioned how many languages were there I think that now there are, because then we, we, we had to add more, we have like 10 languages. We have uh, people from the Muscam nation, many Latin American countries, some Slovenian uh, places, like all over the map, actually. Okay. Um, was there another was, example you wanted to share? Sorry. Yeah, no, just, just to wrap up, because there are so many. I just, I'm just picking uh-huh. three, but the other one was one that we did on unconscious bias. I don't know if you remember, Sara. Uh, but this is one where we started to breach with the equity office. UBC has an equity office and great facilitators. And, and we did this often uh, with the Positive Space Workshop and with the unconscious bias for TAs. Uh, it was great because we think we are super inclusive <laughs> until we really examine ourselves, until we examine who are the people that we hang with. Like, are the people that you hang with, do they look pretty much like you? Then, you know, you, you have to think about that. And it was good because we bring all of those biases to the classroom, to the fieldwork, to a meeting. And sure. so I, I'm interested to know what, what were uh, Sarah's favorite uh, events. So one of the key strengths of the diversity crew is that they became known for the amazing events that they would host. So involving dance or food or making this video, how do you say forestry? So we really had an amazing diversity of creative, out-of-the-box activities that brought our community together, that were open to everybody, that we'd make accessible as possible in a variety of different dimensions. In some cases, we tried out having childcare at the same time as an event to make them accessible to parents, for example. But instead of just thinking about a a series of individual events, which I could rave about all of them, I just want to say a couple words about collectively what these events did beyond just being a single uh, set of events. So what these events did for the atmosphere was to help a lot of people find each other. So people who wanted to be allies and practice their allyship, it was an opportunity for people to find each other and just know that there's somebody else out there that cares. There's somebody else out there who's thinking about the same kinds of things, maybe struggling with the same kinds of things, looking for a way forward for these different kinds of things. So just having everyone find each other made a lot of us happier and feel like we were part of a community and could work together towards a better way of coexisting and feeling like we were building something together. So finding each other was really important, but I don't want to just leave the impression that it was all rainbows and unicorns and it was just about celebrating and having fun. That was certainly part of it. But what that led to, I think, was I feel very strongly that before you have the tough conversations, you have to have some of the easier conversations with people that you know and you trust and you have some camaraderie and uh, friendship. And so what the what these different events allowed us to do was to get to know each other and get to know what issues people were concerned about, but also let us have the easier conversations together so that we had 
some so that we were stronger and better prepared for the harder events so then we could also eventually have workshops about consent and bystander intervention training and things like conflict theater and things that really events and training sessions that really let us go into deeper harder issues that are really hard to talk about but it's made a lot easier if you already have some baseline friendship and and warmth amongst each other. So that that was part of one of the larger big picture results of these kinds of activities. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I can see how, you know, just in any setting, right? When we sit down to dinner with somebody or a meal, we have conversations that we wouldn't otherwise have. I know in the workplace, we often would have a meeting uh, and then I, I, I always have it so that if it's a one day meeting, you have a half a day the first day, you have a captured audience for dinner and then the other half of the day the second day. And those conversations over a meal can really create bonds and, and relationships in ways that you wouldn't have with just a regular meeting. So I can see that fun and and those meals as a great sort of lane one to a conversation that's needed at a deeper level. So that makes a lot of sense. And I can see why that would have, um, you know, garnered your the attention of the CIF to give you that award. I know, and I have to say, when I looked over the um, all the accomplishments that the crew has done, it's incredible. It's very impressive. I, I encourage all the listeners to go to your website and we'll provide that at the end of the podcast, but to take a look at everything that you guys have accomplished because it is quite impressive. Well, the last angle I would say on this is when I started the job as associate dean, I, w- I really spent a lot of time thinking about how do we engage the non-believers? Mm-hmm. First goal is to include people that have been historically excluded, but we also have to get everyone on board, including people who might be skeptical or not see the need. You know, the conversation back then, there were a lot of people that felt like EDI work was one more bit of paperwork. And I I wanted to make it clear from the beginning that we'll make our workplace better because it's actually amazing to get to know the diversity of people in our building and it will make your life richer. And so I wanted to also kind of bring some some joy to it because there's certainly conversations and a lot of uh, challenging things, but there can also be some joy to this work as well. Yeah, I'm interested to know how you were able to approach and, and talk to those non-believers, as you call them. Stefania, can you speak to that for us? Or was that just something that Sarah was spearheading? I think that because Sarah was present in those circles, like in, in more senior meetings and, and things, but I, I just want to... Uh, reinforce what Sarah said. It's it's very like people that understand the importance of this will be there supporting this. But those that are more like particularly, I I, I have the hunch that the older generations or more conservative thinking people are not that comfortable having this, you know, new lens. But at the end of the day, we are nothing but relationships. And I think that that was one way that I had to to talk about these themes with those that struggle a bit more to be to challenge themselves, for example, to use uh, pronouns. Like there, there were little things that could help to start this conversation and to make them think about it. Mm-hmm. But I think Sarah is, is, is better suited for this question. Would you want to follow up with that, Sarah? In terms of how to engage the non-believers, per se, so that's, that's a challenging conversation. So obviously, the, the people that are outwardly antagonistic, that's another set of issues. But there's certainly people, it was a very different conversation back then. There were certainly many people that didn't Perhaps maybe they were neutral or didn't understand why this work was important. And to some people, I think at the beginning of EDI work, they maybe felt like it was just one more workshop or one more set of paperwork or checking a box for the people that were very skeptical. And so obviously the first goal of EDI work is to make sure that we work towards including people that were ex- historically excluded. So that's the primary goal. But I also wanted to think about how do we contend with people that the skeptics that don't understand are just uninformed about why this work is even necessary. And so part of what some of these events did, I think, was also bring some motivation to some of the skeptics to see that you could potentially be part of a really dynamic, diverse international, incredible community that brings a lot of joy to your job. So we have a a very 
diverse faculty of forestry, our students and staff and faculty are from all over the world. And being a part of an international community, what you learn from that, the perspectives you gain, and the joy that you gain from getting to know people from all over the world that may see things differently from you. I think some of these events also helped work a little bit on some people that perhaps didn't really understand why this work was important, but they could see that actually there is some joy in this EDI work that it will make your workplace better. It will make your life better and it will make your interactions with people at the workplace better because you know each other and appreciate each other in a deeper way and come to a place where we know each other and respect each other and really appreciate our differences and can celebrate our differences. And so some of these events that might just look like they're, they're, they're fun on a surficial level also had some of these more, more deeper, deeper meanings and deeper sources of connection for people. And so I think that was one of the reasons they were quite effective. Yeah. So another angle in terms of how to engage the non-believers is I think it's really important to come at EDI work from a bunch of different angles. And so we've talked a fair bit about the diversity crew. In my role as assistant and then associate dean for EDI, my job was to, of course, deal with individual problems on a problem by problem basis. But I wanted to make sure that that wasn't all that I did, that I didn't just solve problems, but that for each problem that I tackled. So if there was uh, an issue between people or an individual was struggling, I thought about what are the policies or lack of policies that are driving and underpinning some of these problems. So thinking about policy is another important angle. And I also realized pretty quickly in the job that I could sit back and think systemically about policies when we encountered a problem, but it was also very a, a sort of an ad hoc way of going about making policies. And so we started a diversity council, which was a different group of people. So a diversity council was tasked with making policy recommendations for our entire faculty. And so we made sure that the council had a wide variety of career stages, ages, ethnicities, and different perspectives were on the diversity council. And they helped bring policies to our attention rather than waiting for a problem to erupt. They were tasked with being a bit more proactive about that. And so just some, some, some examples that are easier to understand is we started thinking about how are we supporting parents in our faculty. And so something that came up on occasion is scheduling meetings really early in the morning or later in the afternoon in a, at a time frame that that anyone who's picking up kids from daycare or dropping kids off at school just simply can't make certain meetings. So when you schedule meetings at certain times of the day, you're essentially going to miss some faculty members, for example, that can't be there because they have kids. And so you're, we realize that we, in some cases, were unintentionally excluding parents from some conversations because they simply couldn't be there at the meetings. We also gave some thought to parental leave policies for grad students. And so typically, grad students that are on a scholarship through the Tri-Council, so NSERC, SHRC, uh, CIHR, they'll get uh, parental leave as a part of that scholarship. And But we also felt like that that wasn't necessarily fair, that only scholarship holders should get parental leave. So we decided as a faculty we would match the parental leave policies of the Tri-Council for all of our grad students, regardless of whether or not they were scholarship holders or not. So that's another example. So instead of singling out the non-believers, you went to a broader umbrella approach, you're saying, so that they were also captured into understanding the benefits to them when it was inclusive. Yeah. And another angle, another approach that we tried was we hosted the first ever career enhancement retreat for women in our faculty. And so that was a two-day professional retreat where we hired a coach and we figured out what the agenda was going to be and then adapted as we went as well. And as a result of that retreat, we ended up talking through a variety of issues that young women faculty 
were having so senior women faculty could understand them better and meanwhile senior women faculty could advise younger women faculty and as a result of some of these conversations we just knew that in the future we'd be able to be better allies for each other so we talked about the challenges of bringing bringing up an issue and how isolating that can be and how scary that can be if no one has your back. So we talked about ways to make sure that we have each other's back. If somebody brings up an issue, we know that somebody else will also speak up and second that emotion, so to speak, and uh, make sure that a squeaky wheel doesn't necessarily not get heard and that other people will support uh, someone when they bring something up. So I think it kind of emboldened us, emboldened many of us to work together and realize that that together we can work to make a culture where it's easier to bring these things up and it's not so difficult anymore. So now if somebody proposes a meeting and it doesn't work with child care, people feel like they can say no. Or then also it just doesn't happen as much anymore, but people feel like they can say no and they can bring it up and it's like, okay, great. Yeah, not a big deal to push back about that, for example. And so I think a key take home lesson is these issues are tricky and hard and you have to come at them from different angles and there's not just one path to victory. Right. That makes sense. I just wanted to say that one of the things that I think work a lot uh, with us uh, work well is that we try to keep this group as diverse in membership as possible. Mm -hmm. So as Sarah just mentioned, we were able, we got louder. We started loud because we started with a huge flag hung in the atrium, but we kept being loud. And that was because we were diverse in membership. We had support from every front, particularly Sarah as team. But then we also had admin people, grad students. We connected with other groups like the equity office, the Forestry Graduate Student Association, and many other groups in, on campus. So I think that um, Sara was key because she helped us, uh, you know, to have a systemic change in the faculty, allowing these groups to be as they needed to be. I just just wanted to add that. That makes total sense to me. And, and that's the way I think a lot of organizations are operating is they have a sponsor essentially at the sort of executive level that is able to advocate for DNI across the organization. <clears throat> so that's really good, especially when you think back to 2016, what was going on. Okay. Um, one of the other key takeaways I recall from reading your accomplishments was the challenge of relying on volunteers to do DNI work versus paid positions. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. And that's that's one of the big lessons over the years from from doing this work is that I find in a lot of institutions, sometimes this work starts with volunteers, people getting together in an unpaid capacity to do this kind of work. And the unpaid positions are problematic for a lot of different reasons. So I first started thinking about this in work in conservation, where we often have unpaid internships for students. And it's, it's unfortunate, but the types of students that are able to do unpaid internships are generally the students that aren't working a full-time job, or it's the students that have support from their parents or their grandparents to allow them to take unpaid jobs in conservation that look great on the CV. It looks like you have scientific experience. Mm -hmm. However, the students that are working a part-time job flipping burgers aren't able to do an unpaid internship. And so their CV might not look as good to continue on in the field, but they're, they're maybe as amazing and brilliant as the students that are able to do this unpaid work. And so thinking about that in terms of EDI work, the diversity crew was all volunteer. And what I noticed was as we moved a along through the years through this work, I really felt like relying on volunteer positions was not enough. And huh. so I encourage people doing EDI work before you agree to take on a position, make sure you have a budget to do some work. And so I, I served in this associate dean role for about five years. And before I stepped down, I lobbied pretty hard for a standing budget as well as some support staff, some students to help the next person that was going to take this role. And what will not be a surprise to many people is as soon as we had paid positions to do this work, the diversity of students that we were able to hire just expanded. So we were able to get 
a broader diversity of voices to helping us do this work because we had paid positions to do this. And so I really encourage if you're in a position where you're controlling the budget strings and you see a volunteer group in your institution, think about how you can support them with funds. Think about how you can set up paid positions to do this kind of work. And uh, it's really, it's going to broaden the, the voices that you hear from, but also there's people who deserve to be paid for their EDI work because they're professionals in this matter. And so we can't, we can't just rely on people in our organizations who may be from uh, historically underrepresented groups. We can't rely on them and make them do this kind of work. We uh -huh. should pay professionals and it also sends a really important message that this work is valued. I totally agree. I've seen that even with my work. People always question the the value, the, the cost associated with doing the work, and it's like, well, this is the price, you know. But people don't uh, they don't value it in the same way. They they do more so, but it's still a journey, I think, for a lot of people. Well, I think that's a really good segue to another question I have for you guys, and uh, and and it's about best practices that you may have based on your five years of experience um, for others, other academic institutions or or anyone else for that matter that that they should list, look out for. Can you give us a few of your most impactful actions that you've undertaken, and that may be helpful to the listeners here? Yeah, I was trying. I feel like my first reaction is that. I don't want to feel like we, we, I don't know how to say this, but we are in the process. It's a working process. It's not that we reach to a point that I feel confident enough to say, we did it with this check, you know, moving on. I, but I feel that there has been things that have been important and I could feel the friction because, um, for example, to start when we did the, all the activities with the diversity crew, um, it was a break in the climate of this faculty because people were able to, to feel that they belong. Uh, but with the work of the current dean, we are, for example, doing uh, webinars about, uh, for example, about themes that are not often talked in the forestry field. We, we talk about blackness in the forestry field. Uh, and this was also with the help of, of, of Dean Sarah Gergel at the time. And we were lucky to invite uh, Yemi Adeyeye, Dr. Yemi, to talk about the stereotypes around forestry. Uh, I think that was very impactful for many because we kind of realized that when you think of forestry, there is certain image attached to it. And so mm -hmm. it was a, a good way to just reflect on that. What are, what's the stereotypes? Then we also invited... And can, uh, I, can I add yeah. something to what Estefania just said. So she she was the brainchild behind the virtual lunch in the forest where she interviewed people from a variety of different perspectives and voices that we don't usually hear in forestry. And so that was an idea she had and implemented it. And if you haven't heard any of those discussions, they're amazing, but it opened up the space to talk about some things that we weren't really talking about, things like what she said in terms of talking about what it's like to be a uh, black person in forestry, that's a pretty white dominated field. Talking about ableism and universal access, like she opened the space for conversations of things that many of us were not already talking about. So her virtual lunch in the forest, I think, was a pretty uh, amazing initiative that she started. That's great. Yeah. So the, we'll have to get the link to that when we're finished here. So carry and, on, Maria Stefania. And also, you know, we launched a podcast where we interviewed. And I feel like all of these endeavors were something that we need to start from scratch, like mm -hmm. knowing how to edit, knowing what to how to ask, dealing with issues with sound, but also paying like people for the webinars, for the podcast. And it was like a very different thing. You know, we are here to do research and all of the science. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is as important. That's what what I want to say. Like because I feel like what I've got from as a feedback is that people really wanted to have these conversations, but didn't know how to start, didn't know how to ask. Mm -hmm. And and I think that one of the things that I want to say is that it was super important to have the support of of both teams, Sarah Gergel and now Shan Serifi, because they allow these new formats. Like mm -hmm. it was. It's the first podcast in the faculty ever. <laughs> and Excellent. it was, I, I believe, like the first uh, series of webinars in these themes in the faculty. Like, 
That's uh, exciting. So because you co-brand this, you, yeah. you you do it with other people, but this was like in the house. Um, and I and I think that everybody felt that they were compelled to be creative. Mm -hmm. And I, I I want to say like Jamie, for example, the designer at the time, he was just there to help with the posters, but end up doing music and recording videos and everybody, it was like a bloom of creativity mm -hmm. because we all understood it was important. And mm -hmm. and I just want to acknowledge every person in the crew, those that still are here, those that left already the faculty, mm -hmm. but I feel like it was a transformative process for so many people, not just the ones that attended, but even for us. The, the people that were there creating. Well, that's fantastic because the innovation right there is just, it's just proving that diversity creates innovation. And uh, and that's what you guys did. And you did a lot of exciting, wonderful things that uh, kicked off a, a completely new way of being at the university. And uh, that's very exciting. So in, in terms of uh, advice for other institutions, I just kind of want to reiterate these different pillars that are interacting. So we talked about the diversity crew, which brings together allies and uh, builds glue and community. And then the associate dean position that I filled helped think about policy. And instead of solving one problem, think about solving systemic problems. But I wanted to, and those two things were great. What I also wanted to mentioned was a third pillar to this work. And that's something that goes back to this policy issue. And so I realized, you know, partway through our work, we were making a lot of strides in a lot of ways, but I was just one person as a dean and the diversity crew didn't really have the power to change policy. The diversity crew was more changing the hearts and minds of people, which is also really important. So I was thinking, how do we change policies at a systemic level, and how do I get the best advice I can about what policies needed to be changed? So we started a kind of a third pillar of the EDI work, and that was what's called the Diversity Council. And so this was a group of people who were some students, some faculty, some staff, but we got a range of perspectives of people in forestry to sit down and basically talk about what are the policy changes that we want to institute and what are you know not to talk about a specific person that had a problem but rather what are the 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 general issues that we think we can change or things that we can head off at the past by change by making better policies and so i asked Hisham Zarifi to lead that diversity council and they were charged with talking and making a variety of recommendations uh, to the faculty about different policies. And then when I stepped down as associate dean, Hisham was also well suited to take my place as the second uh, associate dean. And so he had the, the feedback and the learning from the diversity council of what uh, different policies needed to be made. But then he also had a cadre of paid positions to help him. So I just want to emphasize there's these three pillars and funding these different pillars is, is really important. But then also thinking about what, what's going to happen when you step down, who are you going to pass the torch to? And I think I, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about how to pass the torch and who to pass the torch to and who I was mentoring to replace me because I'm a, a, a white woman in the Faculty of Forestry and EDI initiatives in general have, have primarily benefited white women. Like if you look at the actual numbers of representation and who's in positions of power, white women have done pretty well in EDI, in academics, in, in, in the university. Not that there's not still problems, but um, we've gained a lot of those benefits. So I think uh, thinking about um, you know, if you are uh, a white woman involved in EDI issues, how are you going to pass the torch and who are you going to pass it to? And can you include broader voices than uh, just your own? And so I was really cognizant of that as sort of the last step as, as I left that role. How was I going to pass along a role that was better and stronger and had more resources than when I started that role? So those were some of the things that I thought about. Sarah, can I add that to that piece? I just wanted to, to have that link to what you just said. I know Sarah for a long time, 
and I've worked with her closely. And she often has this full awareness of who she is, who she embodies, you know. Uh, but Sarah is also a person that often says nothing about us without us. And so I think that is it's great also to recognize that uh, a white woman in power uh, can create and can make a lot of changes. They, they, they can use that power. And, and, and Sarah is one example of a person that has used that power in a way that benefited a lot of uh, black indigenous people of color members in the faculty and beyond. So I, I just don't want to, to have that idea sitting there because it's not just who you are, but what you've done. And, and I, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I find that uh, I often talk about the need for wi white women to be aware of their role as allies. And um, sounds like Sarah has been doing that very well, uh, a very good job at doing that at the UBC. And and uh, I commend you, Sarah. I think that's great. That's exactly what the path we're taking here with the Free to Grow initiative. Uh, as a white woman, I've been sort of leading the charge on things. But as we move into phase two, it's my desire to have other people represented in the front lines and showing leadership positions as we move through this initiative. So I completely agree with that approach. Well, we've had uh, a fantastic conversation. Time is ticking. And um, I want to thank you both for your, your time today. It's been a great conversation. And I think our listeners will agree that you've done some amazing things to move the needle forward on EDI at UBC. Uh, I hope our listeners are picking up some of these useful best practices to onboard where they can do things themselves. And even if you're not in academia, these ideas can be applied, I'd say, pretty much universally. Before we sign off today, though, can I can I have you guys tell the listeners how they can learn more about your work and where they can find each of you directly if they'd like to follow up with you? Absolutely. So you can find me uh, on Twitter and you can find me at sarah.gregel at ubc.ca. So I'm, as I mentioned, I stepped down from my role as Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, but I'm pretty excited that in January... I'll be assuming a new role as Associate Dean of Academics. And so part of my role there will be thinking about how we can add more Indigenous content to our curricula and uh, have conversations about uh, ableism in our classes and our programming and our discipline of forestry. So I'm really excited to continue these themes in a different role. And I'd be more than happy, anybody that wants to reach out and chat more about our experiences, um, I'd be really, really happy to share uh, what I've learned. Excellent. And Stefania? Yeah, I, I am very active on Twitter. Um, I can share my Twitter handle later on and, and also have a website. I would like to use this space to, to say to those that belong to the BIPOC uh, community, tell them that they belong. Uh, I struggle a lot with belonging and to tell them that there is no such thing as being professional when you are not honest and true to your to yourself. So reach out to people. There is always people around. And if they're not in person, it can be virtually, but just be be true to you, to your family and, and keep it Keep going, keep going forward, keep pushing, and, and things are changing. I've seen a change, and I think that we have to remain hopeful and remain pushing the boundaries. Those are wonderful words to end with. Thank you very much. And thanks to you both once again. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you so much. Gracias. Peu callao. Gender, diversity, and inclusion are crucial to the advancement of a thriving and resilient forest sector. As we continue to grow and change, we all have a role to play in making our sector a place where everyone has the support they need to succeed and thrive. For more information on how you can take action and help make a difference, follow Free to Grow in Forestry on social media or visit us at www.freetogrowinforestry.ca. And if you have a story you think should be heard about an experience you have had or what you'd like to see happen in the Canadian forest sector workforce, we'd love to hear from you. Please email us at freetogrowinforestry at cif-ifc.org. Together, we can move forestry forward.